Well, good morning, guys, and welcome to the show. Fernando? Welcome to the show. Today, we have an answer to a question that we get asked commonly. We're working on a Ford, what is this? Uh, Ford Fusion? Fusion, and the reason why this particular question is great for this car as an example. For one, it has an outboard amplifier that is not a premium, so it's not badged. It doesn't say Sony or anything like that. And two, one of the things you guys are always asking about and we have to talk about constantly is DC offset or high level to low level, any integration like that. Today, this car is a perfect example to show you some of the testing that we do and that you should be doing too when you put a stereo in your car, specifically a sub amp. Join me today as we take a look in the trunk. Ready, Fernando? Let's go. Let's go. This particular car, it's, it's nothing special. It has the eight inch touchscreen, it has tweeters, or it has speakers in the bottom of the door, but nowhere on here does it say Sony or B&O or anything else that it might say. However, we have speaker here, speaker here, and when we play it, we have a speaker here, and then there's also speakers up here in the rear deck. That's way too many speakers to be powered off just a simple radio. Even factory, it's four speakers typically. Now we wanna turn it on and take a listen, because sometimes they don't put speakers in these doors. So we wanna hear it, and we did, and there's, oh, sound. We listen to these, and they only put out bass. Hmm, some manufacturers, off the top of my head, I can think of one, that's Honda and the Pilot and the Ridgeline. They have a sub amp built into the radio that powers the factory sub. Ford has never done that. That leads me to believe that there's an amplifier somewhere in here powered for just the subwoofer, which they have done. And in this car, it's located where the bigger factory amplifier would be, which is right here behind the side panel. So looking at the amplifier, we have two plugs, which we'll remove. And we need to figure out which one is the output and which one is the input because there are two plugs. Now some plugs, like there's enough here for it to be input and output all on one side. Why four didn't do that? Well, that's up to them to figure out. This one has four wires on it. And I can look right over here at the rear speakers and see that on the passenger side, they have a set of brown speaker wires with various colors. And on the driver's side, they have a white and a green, which this has. That leads me to believe that these are the speakers. Now I can simply test that by doing a couple different things with my digital multimeter. First, we'll try continuity. Continuity is where I take my two test leads, and when they touch, they make a sound. I'll put one into the brown wire with a white stripe here, and I'll grab the brown wire with a white stripe over here in the factory plug, and I get continuity. I can move over to the next wire, and I get continuity as well. If I can't get to the speaker, I can do a resistance or an ohm load test and see if it looks like a speaker. So I wanna look for something like four or two ohm. Getting like a four ohm load there. So this tells me two things. One, that these are indeed the speaker wires. And two, the factory subwoofer is somewhere around four ohms. Now I could do one other test, which is using a tone generator. <laughs> And that tells me that indeed, this will let me audibly hear the speakers to make sure they actually still work. At this point we know, even though we've done three tests, we know one thing. That is an output and it goes to these speakers, but we don't actually know anything else about it. As far as hooking up to it for a subwoofer, we know that plays bass sound, which means we could conceivably connect to that. And because it is playing bass sound, the amplifier we connect to it will continue to play bass sound. However, we're not done there because we wanna know a little bit more. Specifically, is this a variable voltage output that we can use, or do we have to go after the amplifier? Since how it's just a sub amp, it's awfully alluring to think, hey, it's probably variable voltage, and I could just maybe solder on some RCAs. Let's figure out how to test for that. This plug has five wires. It has a twisted pair, and then two fatter wires, and this rogue purple wire here. We'll set our digital multimeter to DC, which is the line with the dashes beneath it. I'm gonna connect the ground test lead to a ground and what I think might be positive and the meter is showing me 12 volts connect to what I think is ground and there again so I have power and ground I believe that this little purple red wire here is the remote turn on however most remote turn ons for Fords are six volts truly really isn't gonna do us much good right now it's not metering anything can you turn the car on for me 
With the car on, it is in fact six volts. For this, if we were gonna use this, we could use something like a TR4 that has a six volt to 12 volt trigger on it and activate our output, but we'll wait and see what else we're dealing with here. That leaves these two wires here as being our signal wires. We wanna switch to using an RTA for a second. And the reason why we wanna do that is we wanna see if there is in fact just sub signal coming out of here. Is it full range? What's actually happening? Playing some pink noise, we could see here that in fact it is just playing sub frequency out of this output. So that's good. What we want to test for is how much voltage is coming out of this output. This is important because you want to make sure that it's something that's within operation range of the amplifier. If it's too low, that could be bad. And if it's too high, that could be bad also. For the next test, we're going to switch this to AC voltage, which is the squiggly line with the V underneath it. And we're going to play a 40 hertz test tone. And we want to see how much voltage is coming out on the meter. Go ahead, turn it up. So what we saw there was 280 millivolts. Now 280 millivolts, really nothing. But let's see what the amplifier we're gonna be looking at has for input sensitivity on the low level input side. So it says it'll work between 250 millivolts to 10 volts. Even though it is a little bit higher than what that amplifier says, that means we're gonna have to turn the gain up all the way, all the way, in order to get any form of signal out of that amplifier. I don't really like that. More than likely you're gonna get some kind of a noise introduced into it, and even though it's a sub amp, we're still gonna get noise. That means that the line level output of the factory radio going into this amplifier is not a good option for this particular install. That means we should go after the amplifier. In most cases, we'll tell you, it's variable voltage, it goes up and down, it's perfect, use it. But if it's not a good enough signal coming out, you definitely don't wanna use it. Let's test after the amplifier and see what we have going on there. The amplifier is plugged back in and we have our test leads now on the output side of the amplifier. Our input is plugged back in and our meter is still set to AC voltage. Turn it up. As you can see there, we're closer to 9 to 10 volts of output at 40 hertz. That's a much better signal to use to go into our amplifier. You could try adjusting the signal from 40 to 50 to 60 to 70 and see where this peaks out. But we know at that low of a frequency, we still almost have 10 volts of output. That means we need to check the next thing on our amplifier is how much high level signal this amplifier will take. In this case, this amplifier will take 1 to 40 volts of input. And in case you were wondering, this is a kicker CX a 1200.1. Knowing that high level, this will take anywhere between one to 40 volts, we're good there. So even if we adjusted the frequency and saw how much it peaked at, let's say it goes up to 15 volts or anything like that, we're good. That amplifier will take it because it'll take up to 40 volts. We have nothing to worry about on this one. However, what makes this amplifier fun is that we are gonna be using high level and it uses DC offset in order to turn on the amplifier. We'll talk about what that is in a minute, but there's no switch to turn it off. So we have to test for DC offset offset and also make sure that it turns off and turns on. Now DC offset is a five to six volt DC coming over the AC signal output. That signal we just measured, there's DC hidden in that, not the distortion kind. Let's take a look. Switch the meter to DC voltage again, which is the line with the dots underneath it. Take your test leads, take the positive, connect it to one of your speaker leads and take the negative and connect it to a ground. The digital multimeter will read five to six volts of output. If your car is on at this point, go ahead and turn it off, shut all the doors, leave the digital multimeter plugged in in a place where you can actually see it. Arm the car and see what happened. Let's try that. Now Fernando has his watch going up front to see how long it's gonna take. And we'll keep an eye on this voltage here. And it's off. That was about 60 seconds when you arm it. We do one more test where we disarm it, we exit the vehicle, we enter the vehicle, and we see how long it takes there. Does the same thing. In this case though, that means you're just letting the car go to sleep naturally. I'll just jump to the end. It takes three minutes for this car to go to sleep and shut off the DC offset. This is normal. However, where a lot of people get scared on DC offset, meaning they don't think it's working, is when they do this. Disarm the car. As you can see there, the DC offset turned back on. That's perfectly normal. 
that's what happens because there's sounds that need to be done in the car and the car is starting to boot up. There's a lot of fun things happening in the radio and they want to use as much time as they can so that when you actually sit down in the car and go to drive away, they've limited how long it takes for that first screen to boot up so you hear sound. If it didn't do that, it would take like a minute, minute and a half for the audio to start playing and nobody wants that. They don't want to be halfway to wherever they're going and the radio suddenly kicks on. As soon as you hit on lock or as soon as you pull on that door handle, automatically starts the wake up cycle on the radio, which turns on the DC offset. It's okay, it's not gonna hurt anything. A couple things we've learned today. We've learned how to measure the output voltage of the signal we're gonna be using to feed into our amplifier. That's important to know so you don't overdrive or blow up the input section of the amplifier. Two, we've learned how DC offset works, how to measure for it, and some of the strange characteristics that it has. Now this amplifier, as I said, doesn't have an off switch for DC offset. That means if we don't want to use DC offset, we can't use the internal high level to low level built into this particular amplifier. And they're not alone. Plenty of amplifiers out there that are the same way. If that's the case, you're gonna wanna go with some form of an external high level to low level adapter. That way you can hook up the remote turn on wire, this guy here, to another form of accessory turn on to turn on and off the amplifier. Once you're done and it's all correct, you should be able to do something like this. All right, Fernando, feel good? On to the next one, guys. Like you said, you guys have a great day. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.